Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and um, thank you for having me here. Cathy had just touched on a little bit about the difficulties of um, finding material on Chinese. I was just chatting with Ian from Historic Society. There we've got about 14-ish um, thousand images. There's one image showing a partial view of a Chinese market garden. That's it. There's nothing else in the entire collection referencing Chinese. And so there's a, a great scope. Why they remained a mystery um, photographically, I, I don't know. Other areas, there certainly are Chinese photos, but, um, but none, for, none for this entire region. But also, just um, starting with Brennan and Garrity's, one of the difficulties in trying to find more about Chinese um, people in this area is that there's no written material available that, um, that I'm aware of. There may be stuff somewhere, but basically it's, um, it just doesn't exist, or it doesn't exist in, in the open realm where we can actually access it and find it. When Brennan and Garrity um, looked at dealing with um, different China, oh, where are we? I'll go back to that first one. Brennan and Garrity's store traded from 1871 until 1972. Um, the last owner was George Garrity, and he passed away in November 73. He left the properties to niece and nephews who were disposing of the contents of the store. The Historic Society got involved, and they were allowed to come in and take some of the things that they wanted. The niece wouldn't let the ladies from the Historical Society in because the place was rickety, run down, um, full of holes in the floors. She thought if the ladies went in, they'd hurt themselves, and she wouldn't forgive themselves. The men could go in, it didn't matter if they hurt themselves, it was their own silly fault. So, so it was the ladies um, that weren't allowed in. It was the ladies that got the National Trust involved with, um, with the acquisition of the store. When the Trust bought it, they bought the shop, they bought the cottage, the stables, the house next door and everything that was inside the store. In the 70s it was just considered a load of junk, a load of rubbish, nobody really wanted this stuff, we don't know what it is. There's all these old papers where nobody was bothered collecting it, it was just not important to keep. The contents include in excess of 50,000 invoices, accounts, letters, bills, and they detail what was going on in the store from the 1870s period right through to pretty much when George closed the shop. The store now trades as a museum about itself and its place in the community of, um, of Maryborough, and it's a unique part of our history where it's a rare in situ collection just to survive intact is, is quite unusual. Looking at Queensland goldfields, this is only a part list and some of those dates are just indicative. Um, Nashville, Gimpy, 1867, Charters Towers, 71, Palmer River, 1873, Mount Morgan, Paradise, 1889-90, Mount Shamrock, 1885-86. That's um, just a few from this, this area. The, uh, the gold, of course, is where, um, where Chinese were attracted. And they, Australia's mineral resources um, was a, a source of new potential new wealth, not only for Chinese but for other other migrants coming into Australia. We had gold in the Californian gold fields where Australians went over to there. They came back um, to do the Australian gold fields, and Americans would have come with them as well. But certainly there was a large amount of um, Chinese coming. In. They uh, most of those people were miners, labourers, storekeepers, market gardeners, laundrymen. If there's any other um, job that was going, the Chinese would take, where some of the white people wouldn't take some of the jobs at all. They would leave them to the Chinese. And what you'll see when we go on, some of those, um, the better jobs ended up being taken over by the Chinese and the whites were left without, um, without work. This is Gympie, about 1908. Um, you can see how Gympie had changed. In the 1860s, Gympie was a, as a, a tent town, basically, and then it developed and grew, uh, as did other towns. Looking through the chronicles or through Trove, we're finding different kinds of information about what some of the Chinese people were doing. And um, having market gardens was certainly one of the common factors with a lot of Chinese. Right around um, every town where there was gold, there were lots of market gardeners. It would take them a while to set up the gardens, to dig them, to till the ground, then to propagate the, the vegetables and then to sell. So you're looking at at least a year. Um, before they could get any product to actually sell to, um, to people that were on the, on the diggings. And by that time, you would find that storekeepers had been setting up and they were wanting new fresh produce and the, the miners were also wanting whatever they could get that was fresh. And so the Chinese were developing that where, where the white people would go after the gold digging. 
They would do that, where the Chinese were setting up with market gardens. White people also set up things such as storekeepers, and generally it was the storekeepers that made the money in the gold fields because people had to eat or they had to buy supplies, um, tin pannikins, things like that would have to come from somewhere, and it's storekeepers that would make the money. But the Chinese, just on the quiet, were also making their own money because of, of selling the fresh fruit, vegetables, anything that they could grow, they were selling um, to whoever would buy it. One of the towns that's a favourite of mine to research is Mount Shamrock. It was, um, it was Mount Shamrock and Paradise were two gold mining towns which were um, west-ish of here uh, in the Biggerton area. Now Mount Shamrock was, um, was settled in 1886 it first became settled, but this is one of the earliest um, descriptions that I've, I've got of Mount Shamrock. Well, this is only a partial description, it's quite long. Um, but there's no mention of Chinese people in Mount Shamrock in 1887. Um, which, is, which is quite unusual because any new gold mines would attract the Chinese. So why they weren't there at that time um, is just a bit of a mystery. I think probably they, they turned up after the township developed and after the mine was developing a bit further, or the mines were developing a bit further. So that information about what was going on there, it just doesn't exist, what was happening. Only through, we've got the travelling correspondent who, um, who wrote articles in all these regional areas out from, from this, this um, central point. So he'd write his stories and send them back to the Chronicle and they would publish them. And when they published them, they, they, like today, they'd edit most of the information out. They didn't edit anything out. Here I think he says there's about 100 people, uh, miners, storekeepers, handicraftsmen. Um, I don't know what uh, handicraftsmen were actually doing there, what they were making, whether they were making tools, whether they were making um, furniture, we don't know what they were doing. But there's, there's just no information on what the Chinese potential was in that area. This is a post office from Mount Shamrock much later on. They'd gone from being a tent town to more substantial structures. There were a number of people shopping um, at, in Maryborough supplying or wanting goods for, for Mount Shamrock. Uh, Margaret Burns, she was, um, she's not in this photo, but she was buying goods wholesale from Brennan and Garrity and she had a shop out there at Mount Shamrock. There's a lot of research about her. Her husband, William Burns, was a poet and known as Willie the Poet, and he wrote um, a number of poems in, on Queensland history, but I haven't been through them all, and I haven't found anything referenced in Chinese, which I assume there should have been something of Chinese related, because he would have seen them. He was first out at Dundathu, I don't know whether the Chinese were out there, but um, in Maryborough, and certainly at, at Mount Shamrock, so he should have come across Chinese at some stage. Chinese in Queensland, this is, um, these figures uh, from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, uh, I don't know how they got them, but another report I read in 1877, I couldn't find it to put in here, but in 1877 there was supposed to be 100,000 Chinese in North Queensland. I don't know how they, they came to that figure, but that was about the same time that anti-Chinese sentiment was starting. People didn't want Chinese here. There were so many of them coming into the country uh, particularly for gold and taking on other jobs, that they wanted to get rid of them. So whether the 100,000 was a, a, a fictitious figure or something that somebody had based um, solid research on, we don't know. But that's certainly um, 10 times more than the figure that um, um, ABS gave in, in 1881, 11,000, they, so they claim that we're here. But the relationship there shows that there are always more Chinese men than Chinese women. So the women were, were very minuscule in, in, in the scheme of things. The anti-Chinese movement in Queensland was, um, was growing quite strongly. People basically hated them. Um, and this is just one typical kind of correspondence which related to them, trying to, uh, trying to get rid of some of those Chinese, trying to exclude them from the colonies of Australia. And that was uh, 1887, it was 10 years after that first survey that I found showing, um, showing that there were 100,000 of them here. Certainly by, um, by the 100,000 figure, there should have been more Chinese in this region particularly with gold for Gympie. Um, so whether that, that figure was wrong, I don't know, but they, they didn't like them here. This one, Matthew Miller, I don't think he got in, but he was criticising um, the, the amount of Chinese that were coming in. And so it was quite, quite blunt. It was right in your face. There was no um, sanctioning what went in the, in the newspapers. They just wrote anything and everything. This one, I blocked out a couple of... Um, 
choice words so that people don't get offended by it, but they, were, they wrote everything down. It wasn't, wasn't a problem. <coughs> Mr Bushnell, he was a, a local fellow. Um, and finding more about Chinese, you're finding more about other people in this area. He was in Northern Territory and then obviously sailed around through the top of, um, top of Australia. But he was warning them of, um, that the jobs were taken by Chinese. The wharf labourers, milkmen, farmers, laundrymen, boatmen were all Chinamen. Um, at Thursday Island, they ran hotels and billiard tables as well. So the Chinese were taking over northern, northern Australia, and that's what people didn't like. And Mr Bushnell wanted people to, um, to not support the Chinese businesses at all. Whether you sold them stuff, you're not to sell it to them. If you bought stuff off them, stop buying from them. So buy from the, the non-Chinese um, Chinese merchants. Immigration, we had over 22,000 immigrants came into Australia between 1860s and 1900. And that was a, a small in comparison to the 100,000 odd Chinese that were here, but that was still a lot of, lot of people coming into the port of Mirabra. When um, Queensland was um, separated in 1859, Mirabra, Gladstone and Rockhampton all gazetted warehousing ports, which meant um, cargo ships could come in, uh, and Mirabra had the added bonus of... of um, of immigrant ships coming in. So there was uh, 100 tonnes of salt. And that wouldn't have all been um, offloaded here, but there's an incredible amount of, of that kind of stock coming in. This is uh, a map from the Australian United Steam Navigation Company showing all the trading routes from, uh, from England right through. And uh, there are some shipping routes that went up into China. And those Chinese routes is where the, the goods from China were coming and as well as those Chinese migrants were coming into, into Australia through those same shipping ports. And of course, uh, they wouldn't come into Southern Australia as easy as they would come into Northern Australia because of a, a more direct route for, for the Chinese and the shipping, shipping companies to get to. Imports are 1863. We're fortunate that in the Chronicle that there were regular updates of what was coming in. If passengers got off a, a boat, they wrote the pass who, who the passengers were. If goods came in, they wrote down all the goods and generally they identified who were buying which goods. So Brennan and Garrity bought goods that would be eight packages, um, whatever would, would come in was Brennan and Garrity were buying it. This one shows there's four and a half thousand pounds of tea come in just in August 18, um, 1863. That was just into Meribar. And that's quite an enormous amount compared to coffee, which was um, just under 600 pounds of coffee. Um, so we're obviously bigger tea drinkers than we were coffee drinkers. But a lot of that tea would be also Chinese consumption as well. Because I don't know whether they drank coffee, but certainly they were big tea drinkers. They drank tea differently to how we drink it, where we might have it with milk and sugar. They had a lot of green tea. And this doesn't distinguish between green or black tea. It's just, just a plain uh, volume of tea. Researching the Chinese. Finding the Chinese customers is easy when we're searching the records. Um, the names are easily recognised and, uh, and showing all their accounts and their payments. Chinese customers from at the store were buying fruit, vinegar, wine, fruit trees, uh, nothing else. For the whole history of the Chinese dealing with the store, they were buying nothing, no food products at all. They had their own Chinese storekeepers and so they were buying totally from those Chinese storekeepers. There was nothing that they were buying from, from places like Brennan and Garrity. And we know, going through the records, that they're, they're so intact that if there are records missing, um, we, we would identify with the other records where the, where the Chinese, what Chinese were buying here from Brennan and Garrity. The, uh, the records that survive there, they give us the basic information on what was happening, how customers were dealing with the store. We go through things like Trove, which is one of my favourite things to go through. Um, rate books, we haven't gone through rate books as yet looking for the Chinese, because a lot of Chinese, we don't know whether they own land here or whether they rented land. Depending on who the clerk at the um, council was at the time, whether they wrote down residents as occupiers of the building or whether they wrote down just people who owned the buildings. Different clerks wrote different things at different times. So there may very well be Chinese names turn up in the council records, but um, the microfilms of those are quite tedious to go through if you're looking for individual names. So they're, they're a, bit of a, a bit of a shocker. 
uh, as, as with our, um, same thing with um, looking for people like um, R. Chat. He's one of mine that I've done work on. Looking for him in Trove, every article with R comes up, every article with Chat comes up. So you're forced to go through thousands of records to try and find the ones that relate to R. Chat, a Chinaman. Um, it's very difficult trying to, trying to chase them through some of their names on Trove. Chow is another one. It's another name that's not easy to, um, to track. Long is another one, comes up as Long in, in Trove. So all these strange spellings of Chinese names, um, Trove um, doesn't like them because it picks up all these thousands of other variations of those that were with similar spellings. Ma He. He was a bit of an interesting character. When where Brennan and Garrity store now is, or is, or always has been, right over the road before the store was long built, there was a hotel which was built by um, Robert Newsom Milner. Next door to his hotel, 1863. Next door to his hotel was a new shop which was owned by Mahi. He had a little Chinese um, shop right opposite Brennan and Garrity store. So what we found is that he'd gone back to China directly from Maryborough and he brought stock back into Maribor, and some of those were Chinese crackers. And he held a, a cracker night in the street. So 1863 having a cracker night was a, a big promotion for him to saying that he could get these unusual things. By 1863, Brennan and Garrity had arrived on the David MacIver, so that was the second immigrant ship that came to this area. And they probably would never have seen firecrackers. And so all these new, new migrants that came in would have had the option of, of looking at these, um, these new wonderful things from, from these Chinese shops. When, um, when Ma He left the shop, his store was taken over by George Groundwater, who then later on took over another store next door to Brennan and Garrity's and ran as a butcher shop. So you've got white people taking over what was a Chinese, um, Chinese shop. Ma He moved his store down to Lower Kent Street, and they found him in 1902. He was slumped over a barrel, dead. Dead, dead as a donor. He's, he was gone. And what they did after he died was they auctioned off the contents of his shop. So all his things were, um, were sold off. Um, you might squirm a little when you find a little bit later um, some other things that were associated with his shop. Mahi was exhumed with another Chinaman, Wan Tin. Um, they were exhumed in 1911 to be taken back to China for their, their celestial um, soil, so where they could be buried in their own ground. So he had some, one knew he was here, um, whether it was um, other Chinese people were quite aware of him being here and he died here um, is un unknown. But his friend Jimmy Wan Tin, he was a regular in Maribor. He'd gone back and forth between here and Bundaberg and he'd, um, he was staying at uh, one of his countrymen's houses in Bazaar Street, so we know there were Chinese res residences in Bazaar Street, and he was found dead on the veranda the next morning of a, a broken blood vessel. So, um, so he'd uh, had a, a bit of a, a rough night, I think. But he, was, um, he died in 1887, so by 1911, it was a long time for um, him to be underground before they exhumed him. And so it was quite a, quite a big process to get them back to, to China. Our chat. He was the brother of Mahi. Uh, our chat came down um, to attend to Mahi's effects when Mahi had died. So somebody knew that they were related. How they knew, I'm not sure. Um, but Mahi, when he returned to Bundaberg, he died a few days later of plague. So he'd been in um, Mahi's shop. Um, where he contracted plague, um, I don't know. But when he'd gone back to Bundaberg, he died only, only a few days later. It was after that that Mahi's shop contents were sold. So I don't know what regulations came in with, um, with attending to shop stock where there was somebody that was involved with plague was allowed to, allowed to be in presence. But having Mahi dead on the barrel, I'm not sure that I would have wanted to have bought some of the goods that, um, that he'd actually died on top of. There's another one, Gimpy, Ah Ling. Um, ling is another word that's hard to find because we had Brennan and Gary who were selling ling fish. So anytime you look for ling, you come up with fish as well as um, other things. Um, he was buying, he'd sent back 36 crates, so he'd bought large volumes of oranges from Brennan and Garrity, and they'd sent it down by the train, and he'd sent the crates back, because there was a return on the crates. You got credit for the crates that you, you brought back, um, so that Brennan and Garrity could reuse and recycle them, and then um, send them out again. So the crates were always coming back and forth. Having documentation like this um, survive is, is quite incredible that there's so much of it there. 
Another one. There's over 200 ledgers in the Brennan and Garrity collection and these are slowly being indexed and that allows us access to information about the different kinds of customers. This one's for Tong Ting. He was a, a regular customer of the store over a number of years and he paid cash mostly for his stuff. He never had his accounts, none of the Chinese had their accounts extend for far too long. They were a very short time in paying their accounts where others weren't, they were quite a long time in paying them. But this one shows he was buying, um, the next one actually will show his uh, account ledger showing him buying other goods such as vinegar. And that one shows, February 28 shows he bought vinegar in a jug. The jug was um, basically sold to him. He would then return the jug and he'd get a credit for that, um, for that jug that he returned. But he had a, a very small bill of 19 shillings. So he'd paid that before he'd go back and get some more, where other people had um, hundreds of pounds owing to Brennan and Garrity. And there's his account statement. How, did, how this one survived, we don't know. The statements were generally sent out to the customers. Whether he brought that back with his account and paid for it is what we suspect. The, the invoice, uh, the statement's been folded up, ready for um, being in an envelope. So I think it's gone out and it's come back into the store with his payment of the account. Generally, Brennan and Garrity would like pay, write paid on something. And this one they haven't. They've just, um, they're just li left there. We don't know where Tong Ting lived. And we may find um, some other information. He was also called Ting... Tang Tong Ting, Tang Tong Ting, so different kinds of names for the same person. Chaz Q. Hugh was a, a fruit merchant in Bundaberg. He was dealing with Brennan and Garrity over a number of years as well. He's, um, his letters were all well written and uh, we suspect that he couldn't write or read. And this was written by somebody else. At the bottom of the, of the letter it says, per somebody or other. So somebody has been writing his letters for him. Uh, there are other letters from Chinese merchants. There's one in Bund uh, Gladstone, sorry, who was buying goods from Brennan and Garrity, and they wrote in, in a broken English. It's called Oranges Were Orings, and it was, please you send orings once. So you know he was um, writing it himself, but his handwriting was still rather good, where, uh, where Chase Kyu Hu probably wasn't. The fellow in <coughs> Bundaberg, he... Um, he was concerned because the wharfies were getting into his wine. So he ordered a bottle of, uh, a cask of wine and a cask of vinegar. He wanted Brennan and Gary to, to label the vinegar as vinegar one and to label the wine as vinegar two because the wharfies steal the wine. Um, but because of customs, they couldn't relabel anything other than what was in them. If they labelled the, the, the wine vinegar, they would be fined, heavily fined for, for doing it. Um, so they had to label it um, what it was. So it was red wine, that they sent a barrel of red wine to him and he just had to take pot luck whether the wharfies um, tapped into it and drained half the wine out or not. But the vinegar, he knew they weren't going to tap into that. They only wanted the wine. Um, but with Chaz Q. Hugh, he was continually buying uh, fruit. There was fruit trees, a whole range of stuff that he was buying um, to be sent up into Bundaberg. This came from the Bundaberg Mail, um, just about the same period. It showed where his shop was, corner of Ball and Waller Street. That was the first reference we have to actually where his shop was located. Selling the different kinds of products, and some of these were products that he got from, from Brennan and Garrity. Bananas, he was buying a lot of ladyfinger bananas from Brennan and Garrity. And so they're all coming from this region. Wherever he could get his fruit and vegetables from, he would. Brennan and Garrity sent things like fresh oysters from Maribor to as far away as Charters Tower. So they had a very broad um, customer base. And so when people, Chinese people in particular, said they've shopkeepers bought their stuff from Maribor, then other people like, um, like this fellow would, would buy from Maribor as well. The goods would go in the early days by, um, by steamer. Uh, depending on what had duty payable, um, I can't offhand remember whether, whether fruit had any duty payable, but if there's no duty payable, it went straight into the storekeepers. If it had duty payable, it would go through the customs, um, customs office. This was another one from yeah, Chase Q. Hugh. Um, he, this, this is where he's asking for, uh, for ladyfinger bananas. Um, and this one mentions that he's returning some crates on the, the following Monday. 
and this is the Queensland Railway Consignment document for returning of those 30 crates. So 30 crates of oranges, again, is a lot of fruit for one little, um, little shop to go through. August was fruit picking season. Maribor is not renowned for, um, for citrus, but we're growing citrus here very early on. So a lot of citrus came out of Maribor. Gainda, Mundubra areas became the citrus capital, but some of those original trees came from Brennan and Garrity. So Gainda history of, of fruit is, uh, is quite old. Where, where Maribor, uh, it's all gone. There's nothing here. Um, it's just all vanished because the ground, whether the trees couldn't cope in the, the weather here or, or what, whether it was too close to the coast, I don't know. But certainly um, there are lots of fruit going out of Meribah over a large number of years. And most of those um, from, from this region. Lee Tuck. He's, he was a customer, so far only indexed between 1903 and 1905. The interesting thing we're finding more about Chinese is um, some of the businesses that they were involved with. This one I found he had a Kanaka boarding house. It was the first reference I found to a, a boarding house for Kanakas in Maribor, and he was running the boarding house. He um, was often in trouble with the law, and in this instance he had given alcohol to Kanakas, which was an offence. Um, so he was, he was heavily fined um, for, for doing that. Charlie Lee Tuck, he got sick of Maribor in 1900. He was leaving the place for good. He'd had enough. I think he'd had enough because of the amount of times that he'd been arrested for doing um, something that he shouldn't have been doing. Um, he's telling them, including the South Sea Islander boys, the SSI boys, if they left money there, they had to come and get it. Because after he'd gone, um, he wasn't responsible for anything that was in his care. He'd keep it, basically. And if you, he owed you money after that date, he wasn't going to be responsible for any money that, um, that he owed you. But he stayed um, and he died here in, in 1909. Um, and so he was, uh, he's buried here somewhere. I haven't found his, his burial yet. But his, his story deserves a bit more research. Um, finding out more about him, Charlie Lee Tuck. Charlie is obviously the name he was given when he was, when he was here. Lee Tuck was his, his proper name, but Charlie Lee Tuck was the name that somebody's given him. Everyone was a Charlie or a Jimmy or, or whatever. So he got Charlie Lee Tuck. So finding out a bit more about him, I found he married. He married a, a, a white woman um, and she was also often in trouble with the law for selling um, grog to, to the Kanakas. Charlie Lee Tuck was also in trouble at one stage for selling opium. So he had all those things. Opium was, uh, was one of those things that in the early days was, um, was quite okay. We had a number of Chinese dens here, a lot of um, little insidious dens that were, that were here, all run by the Chinese population that were here. Going a bit further, G Singh's a local cabinet maker, so he was making furniture here. So he was, had, had a, a trade behind him. So um, where he got those skills from, obviously, probably somewhere in China. Whether he was making Chinese-related kind of furniture or furniture that we wanted here. In the 1880s, 1890s, there was a big, um, um, I guess, oriental influence in furnishing and furniture design. So if he was doing that kind of stuff, um, it would be well received by the people of America because it was one of those things that they wanted. Hop and Co. He was a, a produce dealer, um, so he was um, he was certainly one of those that was working here for a very long time, and he imported material as well. He could furnish a whole house for seventy two pounds four shillings ten pence. Seventy two pounds was a lot of money. So if he was supplying that volume of furniture at that price, there must have been people other than the Chinese that were supporting him. Because uh, Chinese, I, I guess, didn't always live in fancy houses; they'd live in whatever ramshackles hut they could find, um, rather than having a, a house full of furniture. So he wasn't selling to Chinese, he was selling to the, the white people. And Mr Bushnell would be horrified if somebody went in there and paid £72 for a whole lot of furniture. He'd rather they didn't, um, they didn't support him. Fireworks is one of the biggest things that came in. Most of the Chinese merchants here were importing fireworks at different times. Some of them went back to China directly to import the goods themselves and they'd bring it in over, over a whole range of, um, range of years. He was selling pie melons, um, which was a, a bit unusual. Japanese furniture of every description, that's the oriental influence that's coming in. So he knew that the, um, the local climate was wanting Japanese or oriental furniture. Soi Chao Lung, 
he was um, selling a big range of stuff. He imported a, a massive amount of material from, from all over the place, particularly from China at that period. Uh, when you go through the Chronicle records, I'll come back to him, um, it shows, as I said, it shows who was buying things. When Soi Chao Lung was importing stuff, there's, uh, there's lists of things that he was buying in with other, other uh, merchants, but he was one of the bigger ones that was in, in bringing stuff in. He got into a bit of trouble. He... Um, got a spelling error, but don't worry about that. He was sending um, cases, or trying to send cases of fireworks by train to Gimpy. And he was marking them as general merchandise, um, which he thought he'd get away with it. But um, the railway's um, inspector found that he was um, doing the wrong thing. So they promptly fined him. So he would get away with it. If he could get away with sending fireworks by the train, he would. But I can imagine any vibration from the train, the, the volume of vibration would set off the fireworks. So I don't think the railway guard would want fireworks going off in his um, parcel van. Ah Chong, here we go, he's selling skyrockets and crackers. Um, so they would have been an incredible thing for people to see. Fireworks today, people still love them. Um, but then I guess there weren't the same kind of safety barriers in place where um, workplace health and safety didn't come into it. So they'd sell you um, whatever you wanted, Any, anybody could buy that kind of stuff. Just understanding their role in the community, there's a whole lot of um, gaps. We don't know lots about the different kinds of Chinese that were dealing here in Meribah. We don't know um, where they all came from. Um, Certainly in Northern Australia, there's, they've identified where most of the Chinese came from there, but from here, we don't know. Immigration records are, are not as good for Chinese as other people, um, but also people didn't necessarily come direct into the Port of Meribah. They may have come through Victoria, through the Victorian goldfields. They may have come from anywhere just to come into, um, into this region. With going through the material that we've got, um, finding the Chinese that were, were um, miners in this area is also very difficult. With the gold fields out at Mount Shamrock and Paradise, there, there should have been more Chinese. Um, with the Chinese that we found here, the ads through the Chronicle help identify what they were doing, but not a lot on Chinese miners that were in, in Meribah. And certainly Gympie, there's a whole um, gap of space there which needs to be researched for, for what these Chinese merchants were doing, miners and merchants were doing, where they were coming from, what they were doing and what happened to them. Um, after the White Australia policy, of course, they started to send Chinese back to where they came from. But I guess that'd probably be a bit like um, when they sent the Kanakas back. Um, the Kanakas weren't, weren't, didn't go back to their own places in a lot of cases. They were sent, uh, taken back to wherever they got dumped to. And with the Chinese, it was just a matter of sending them back. And that was it, get rid of them. And, uh, and that's what, what happened. That's Brennan Garrity's store now, and the office there just shows part of the archival collection that's in the store. Mm -hmm. The archives are generally quite fragile, um, but with, with what we're doing, cleaning, caring for, um, indexing, and now digitising, we hope eventually to have um, more access to, to a lot of this information. Researching the content ourselves is, is just only understanding a very small portion of how Brennan and Gertie were dealing with all their customers, not just, um, not just those Chinese ones. But because the Chinese, um, their names are very distinctive, they're much easier to locate um, within the records as who's to who. So far, we've indexed about 10,000 people um, shopping at the store between the 1870s and 1900s, which is a, a large volume. There's less than um, about 100 of those are Chinese. So it's a very small portion of Chinese people that were, were dealing with the store. Again, that, that Chinese population is hidden. Just like the photographs at the Historic Society, there's one out of 14 odd thousand. There just isn't a lot of information that relates to the Chinese. One of the things that um, I've always been on the lookout for in the hope of finding is a, a ledger from a Chinese shop in Meribah, I doubt that that would exist, but there is the potential for those kind of things to, to have survived. Um, if they turn up, the next problem is trying to get them deciphered because you've got different, um, different regional writings and so you'd have to find out more about the, the understanding of the Chinese language and how they wrote and, and from the different areas that they wrote. But at this stage, there's nothing that, um, that survives at all. It just vanishes. Paper-based material, eventually, if, it, if it's been in a flood, it gets lost. If it's been in a fire, it's lost. Um, if it's in someone's collection, um, they don't know what it is, they don't understand it, it just sits there. There may very well be Chinese books in, in museum collections around this region, but they're just in the back of a, a collection where nobody knows what they are. 
Um, so yes, yeah, so understanding the Chinese is, is quite a difficult, difficult topic to, uh, to research. But with the work I've been doing just for this, there's more and more information coming out. And as I said, with Trove, it's a, if you've got the time to spend going through Trove, there's a whole lot of information that will come out, and particularly the police reports. They're easy to, to access, and they are very interesting, finding out exactly what wrongdoings the, um, the Chinese people were doing. If you're interested in the Chinese, um, getting rid of the Chinese from, from here in 1887, there was a lot of anti-Chinese sentiment in Australia, and it was quite brutal what they were saying. The papers didn't care what was written, written down. Um, they wanted the Chinese out as well, so it's quite um, brutal with how they were talking about the Chinese. The Chinese, whether they cared or not, I don't know. Um, but they were still here and they were, they were going to be here to take over some of the jobs and then eventually they got rid of them. <laughs>